my presentation, I'm going to take you on a journey back in time, 100 million years into the past, into the deep past of the African continent. Now, before we travel back all the way to the Cretaceous, let's first travel back to my childhood. I've always loved animals, living and extinct, so I was equally happy handling live snakes on summer holidays in Morocco, I am half Moroccan, or practicing my paleontology and dinosaur presentations in my grandmother's garden in Germany. I was born and raised in Germany. I should add that my grandmother has a deep-seated fear of snakes, crocodiles, and all kinds of dangerous reptiles. And I think she was hoping that I would eventually outgrow my passion for dangerous critters. Well, let's just say that, at least from her point of view, things did not really get any better as I got older. Most of my research deals with extinct animals. I just love the idea of traveling back in time to strange alien worlds full of bizarre creatures. Paleontology, the study of fossils and ancient life, allows you to do just that. It is also our best tool to understand how global changes like climate change or extinction events affect life and ecosystems on our planet in the long term. And this is, of course, relevant today. We're facing a huge biodiversity and extinction crisis. When I, when I go to collect fossils, I typically go to North Africa. For me, Africa is the ultimate fossil treasure trove in the world. My fieldwork takes me to the Sahara Desert in the border region between Morocco and Algeria, a place called the Kemkem. -Kem. It's a very difficult place to work in. You have to climb up steep slopes, you have to deal with snakes, scorpions, sandstorms, and smugglers. It is hard work. And you often spend days on end not really finding anything interesting. But our hard work paid off, and over the last few years, my expedition teams have collected thousands of incredible fossils, including this one here. This is the massive upper arm bone of a large plant-eating dinosaur. And when we're out there, we really try to collect everything we find. Large fossils, small fossils, animal fossils, plants, because we really want to reconstruct an entire ecosystem. And what a strange and bizarre ecosystem it was. 100 million years ago, North Africa was home to giant 12-meter-long predatory dinosaurs. Six or seven different kinds of crocodile-like hunters, some as long as a school bus. We also found abundant remains of giant fish. This is a car-sized coelacanth. So it turns out that 100 million years ago, the Sahara, one of the driest, most inhospitable places in the world today, was home to a vast river system stretching all the way from Morocco to Egypt. I call it the River of Giants. And this River of Giants has produced some truly spectacular creatures. This here is Alanqua Saharica, the phoenix of the desert. We named this creature in 2010. It is the largest flying creature known from the African continent. It's not a bat, it's not a bird. It is a flying reptile, a pterosaur, with a seven-meter wingspan. 
working on these creatures is like working on aliens from outer space. And just last year, we described remains of a giant 15 meter long, sail backed, crocodile snouted predatory dinosaur, Spinosaurus. Spinosaurus is the world's first dinosaur with swimming adaptations. And it also happens to be the largest predatory dinosaur ever found. So when we put all this information together, we can start to paint a vivid picture. This is the Sahara today. But if we could travel back in time 100 million years, we would see this vast river system full of giant fish, flying reptiles soaring in the skies, and dinosaurs walking around on the edge of this river system. So very, very different from the Sahara today. It really gives you an overwhelming sense of what we call deep time. So this is what I do in my scientific work. I uncover these fossils, ghosts from deep time, to reconstruct ancient ecosystems and add little pieces to this incredible epic story, the history of life on our planet. It is the greatest story out there. But my work does not really end there. I have also established a research collection in Morocco, in Casablanca, at the university. And all my fossils have been returned to their country of origin. And this is very important. <laughs> Unfortunately, many African fossils end up in collections in North America or Europe, so we're trying to change that. Another thing I'm doing is I'm involved in exhibit design. This exhibit here is built around the theme of the River of Giants. And you can see our giant sail-backed crocodile-snouted dinosaur right in the middle. This picture was taken in Washington, DC at the National Geographic Museum. Right now, this exhibit is in Milan, Italy. And over the next couple of years, it is going to travel around the world, an ambassador for African science and exploration. Now, of course, I would love to see an exhibit like this one, or maybe even a national museum of natural history in Morocco, so that people there can marvel at their incredible paleontological heritage. It would also be a great opportunity to get people there um, inspired to become the, the new guardians of this heritage. We could train museum scientists and researchers. And of course, such a museum would also be a big hit with tourists. I can tell you all the European and North American tourists in Morocco would love to see a museum featuring the largest predatory dinosaur ever discovered. The other thing I care very deeply about is scientific literacy. I'm trying to get people, especially young people in North Africa, interested in science and exploration. These are covers from international editions of the National Geographic magazine, different language editions. And you can see our sail back dinosaurs on pretty much every single cover. I'll just pick one. This is the Arabic language edition. So this is one way of getting the story out there to this part of the world. We're also using documentaries and online content. And of course, as I said, this is not just about getting people excited about paleontology. It is about getting them excited about science and exploration in general. And I think you will all agree that North Africa, and indeed all of Africa, needs people prepared to push the boundaries, explorers, scientists. And if you talk to scientists in Europe or North America, Many of them will tell you that the reason why they became scientists in the first place is maybe because their parents took them on a trip to a natural history museum when they were young. Or maybe 
they were inspired when they read a National Geographic magazine story on the gorillas of Rwanda. So we're trying to start this spark of curiosity in North Africa. And so far, feedback has been very positive. I get a lot of messages from people all around the world, not just North Africa. I get messages from retired people all the way down to very young people sending me their artwork. I could cover my entire room in these um, uh, drawings. You can see that clearly our discoveries have captured the imagination of people all around the world. But I think we can do more, especially in Africa. I would love to um, bring my three-pronged approach scientific exploration, museum development, and scientific literacy to sub-Saharan Africa. And I'd be very interested to hear if you maybe have some suggestions or ideas. But one thing is for sure, I will certainly try my very, very best um, to share the joy of research and discovery with as many people and as many countries as possible in Africa. This is, I guess, my promise to the next generation. Thank you. And I now invite Manu Chandaria to take the podium. I know. <laughs> Better get out of here. This is by the popular demand. <laughs> uh, when the Minister of uh, uh, Health from Rwanda was speaking, uh, I thought that when he was talking about philanthropy, uh, the model that she showed over here is one model which I'm sure <clears throat> that Rwanda can really share with the rest of Africa. And I'm sure that N Fund, I, I don't know whether he's already gone away or not, uh, the N Fund and the Rockefeller and others can certainly support <clears throat> this whole exercise of not going and finding uh, what will work. But what's working in Rwanda can also work in other countries around uh, Africa. So I think congratulations for what you've been able to do. <clears throat> now, as well, this whole panel of the health was very interesting and in what they've been able to do. Um, I was born at home. At that time, my mother didn't go to the hospital. Maybe there was no hospital available at that time, probably. But I was born at home. And I felt so hurt when I broke my own record that I was admitted in a hospital after 86 years. And so I said, what went wrong? For 86 years, I've never visited, I means I've never been to hospital, never admitted to be hospital. Why should I have been gone now? They could have waited another three, four years <laughs> and, and taken me up. That's it. And that would be the last one. And the record would be remained then. But this is now a broken record. Um, I would suggest that uh, because of the health was the end of this one, let me tell you a story about health. Uh, there was a doctor who could not really practice very well, and his practice was bad. So he decided, what should I do? One day he decided to uh, put a big board outside his office and said, I, my charges are high, $50 a time, but if I don't cure you, I'll give you 500 And my God, everybody would like to go there and say something to happen. But one chap decided that I'm going to earn this $500. So he goes back and says, Doctor, you know, I have lost taste in my mouth. I just can't, I don't know whether I'm eating sweet, I'm eating hot, I'm eating cold, I can't taste anything. He says, is that all? He says, yeah. Put $50 and he calls the nurse. And says, nurse, go to the drawer, number 22, take out a dropper, from the drawer, number 13, and put two drops 
on the tongue of the, client, of the patient. And so she does this one. And he shouts. He says, hey, this is kerosene. <laughs> so I said, well, the 50 are gone because you, you got your test now. <laughs> so he thought that maybe I'll earn another 450. So he goes again second time after a few days and says, you know, I don't know, but I just can't remember now. My memory is dying. I think I'm getting dementia. I can't remember anything short. I can remember long of last year, I can remember. But I can't remember yesterday what I did. I can't remember last week what I did. He says, is that all? He said, that's it. He said, come on, that's your $50. Nurse, take the $50. And then comes back again and says, now, nurse, go to the drawer 22. Take out that dropper number 13. Put two drops. And the fellow says, hey, that's kerosene. <laughs> so he says, your memory is back. <laughs> so another down, another 50. But he would not let it go. So last time he decided, no, I must try to earn that 400 now. So he goes back and after a while and he comes and says, you know, doctor, I can't see now. Everything is becoming hazy slowly, 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 and I'm worried that I'll go blind. He said, don't worry, it's not this. He said, come on, you must do, look, do something about it. The doctor was very honest. He said, listen, one thing I've not done, and that is that I have never been an ophthalmologist. I don't know anything about the eyes. I'm sorry. I think that this time you win. So he goes to the pocket, takes out five notes from his pocket, and gives this to Kim, and says 500. Oh, the guy was so happy. The minute he goes and looks at the notes, he says, hey, these are not 100, they're only 20. He says, how come? Your sight has come back. <laughs> so please remember, when you go from over here, the other part of the, of the health ministry is, Contractible disease. Contractible disease is something which you contract. So when you go out from here, make sure that you find other people who are prepared to do good as much as you are prepared to do good. Thank you so much. A, a seriously hard act to follow. I thought it was going to be difficult following the dinosaurs, but uh, <laughs> this is really hard. Um, these last two days have been um, as much a celebration of the generosity that motivates philanthropy as it's been an exploration of African philanthropy. We've had a chance to see African philanthropy in many of its forms, and there are, I'm sure, many more, but grants, investments, public-private partnerships, uh, mentorship, um, the, uh, those who've decided to put their whole companies to the service of the social good, um, like James Wenge or Bob Collimore. Um, so we've seen each, each of those forms of African philanthropy, and they are each a model for those of us who live outside of Africa, so they're a model to go beyond. I want to thank Madam Kagame. I would like to thank the health minister. I'd like to thank the ambassador um, of, of Erica Barks Ruggles, and I want to thank all the speakers. I want to give a special thanks to the core group, uh, including Manu Chandaria, who has definitely broken all the rules, um, and, and is going to, has started a second career. Uh, I'll let you know about Second City in Chicago. You're sure to have a spot for you there. Um, Sisi Masiwa, Toyan Saraki, Rita Roy, uh, James Wayenge, Kim Balasaji, uh, uh, Ashish Sakar, Hilton Hamil <coughs> Applebaum, uh, and uh, Her Ro Royal Highness uh, Queen Sylvia. Um, and I want to thank a member of my board who's here, Martha Hurtlandi, who's been to the India Philanthropy Forum, the Brazil Philanthropy Forum, and so feels very strongly that this is the most thrilling of the philanthropy forums. I just wanted to leave with you, well, first, I, I have to thank um, 
and I can't thank them enough, is Susie and Sawako and Nicole, uh, Yoadan and, um, and Sue and the media team. Uh, thank you for making this happen. Uh, So I just want to leave you with three thoughts. Um, and, and the first is um, that what inspires and gives purpose to the philanthropy uh, represented in this room is the fact of dynamic, hard-charging, inventive uh, leaders as were all the speakers we saw today uh, and, for, and yesterday. Um, you are the reason philanthropy is so joyous. Um, so thank you. Um, the second is that there's uh, history and culture um, that informs both grantor and grantee, that informs both investor and, and, and investee. Um, so as they, as they work to change the world for the better, um, they know that their, that work is grounded in and builds on a long history, both from a, from a uh, physical, paleontological point of view. There are always too many adjectives, too many syllables when I say that but also uh, from a cultural point of view uh, and the importance of uh, as, as we move forward, as we build on what we've been given, um, to bear in mind that preserving the diversity that's been discussed should never, never uh, be something that we allow um, and that uh, all aspects of of culture uh, needs to be respected as it's improved upon. We certainly never want to see the extinction. Uh, maybe it's okay, some of those creatures you had there, I, I actually didn't want to live with them, but we never want to see the extinction of, of culture. Um, the third thought I'd like to leave you with um, is probably, it's, it's obvious to those among you who had the fortitude uh, last night but if you haven't shared a dance floor with Manu and Aruna Chandaria, you simply don't know how to party. So <laughs> this is. So um, speaking of parties, uh, there's a reception tonight. Uh, the Siegel Foundation has very generously invited us all to a reception, um, and you're to be there. They'll have buses for us at 6:30 out in front of the, of the hotel, uh, be there. Uh, and secondly, I just wanted to mention, I was just told to mention, that buses will be leaving here at 2.45 to go to see the artisans' shops as well. I wanna thank you all. Uh, I really wanna thank you from the depths of my heart. This has been a joyous two days. Uh, and knowing what you're doing just fills us all with admiration. So. Thank you for these two days and thank you for your work. Thank you.